Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. I thank you that we're all back at Eid, and I pray that this semester will be one that we can learn a lot and we understand it a little bit. And I pray that you make this greatest story time to teach us, and that we'll all learn a lot today. Amen. Thank you, sir. Okay, let, we're going to really briefly review. I don't want to spend too much time on it because we have so much we have to get through today for your test. Uh, but we're in chapter four, which is still more stoichiometry. I thought that was cute. Last week we did the experiment. We learned about experimental error. We learned about percentage yield and that we take the actual yield and divide it by the theoretical yield, what we should have got if everything was perfect in a perfect world. <gasps> anyway, um, and then we multiply that by 100 and that will give us the percentage yield. Um, and so uh, that's probably the easiest thing to do in the chapter, in my opinion, <laughs> as far as the math goes. Just, you know the equation and you do it. Then we learned about empirical and molecular formulas. And we learned that ionic compounds actually don't form molecules. They actually are held together by attractions between the ions. And so molecular formulas actually don't apply to ionic compounds. All ionic compounds will be represented with an empirical formula. Whereas covalent compounds, uh, which are made up where they actually are sharing electrons and therefore it makes bonds um, in the Okay, anytime you come in late, Elizabeth, honey, or you guys go out to the bathroom or anything like that and we're filming, just open and close the door real quietly, please. Okay? Thank you very much. And I'm going to step out. And I'm going to step back in. There we go. Okay, can we fit? Good. Um, covalent compounds, once again, those are molecules, therefore you would have molecular formulas for those and many times you will be able to take that molecular formula and divide through by something which in fractions we'd call it simplifying it, wouldn't we? And you would simplify it down to its lowest whole number ratio so you could take the molecular formula down to the empirical formula, although some molecular formulas are the empirical formulas because there is no common factor that you can divide through. Okay, so far so good. Those are like the two easiest things in the chapter, aren't they? I mean, that, that's not real hard. Um, then we got to determining the empirical formula of the metal oxides. And we did do that last time we were together, right? The, the first part, where we actually, um, when you burn something and you're told that that something is made up of strictly, well, in the case of the example problem on page 236, where it said you're taking zinc and you're burning it in oxygen, then you're determining what the empirical formula of the product is. You know that the product is made up of zinc oxide because those are the only two things that were offered to you. Um, on page 237, uh, on the comprehension check problem, it tells you they took a sample of a specific metal, titanium, and they burned it next to oxygen, and then they tell you the, the product's mass. And so from that, we saw that if we took the titanium and we took it to moles, and then we took the product and subtracted the amount of grams of the titanium, you would ex you find the amount of oxygen that has combined with it as far as the mass, then you would take that to moles, and then once you have the moles of each of those, you can figure out the empirical formula very easily, can't you? You just divide both by the lowest number of moles, and that tells you the ratio that they take to one another. If you end up with a wacko ratio like two and a half and one, or you know, or two and a half and one and a half, multiply it by two. Right? So you'll just go to five and go to three and, and just use it that way. That's, praise the Lord, that's not hard. That's not the hard part. Okay, so I think this is where we were supposed to pick up on page 237 because I started into it and then I decided I, I felt pity on you and wanted to let you go to lunch. And so let's, this is where we need to pick up, all right? Okay, so here he tells us that there's actually this combustion apparatus which uses hygroscopic material to absorb the water out and then it uses another material which absorbs carbon dioxide out. And so when we use this and we burn something in it, we can actually determine what the mass of the water that produced is by the combustion reaction and we can determine what the mass of the carbon dioxide is in the combustion reaction by using this uh, process and from that we can determine what the empirical formula is of the original thing that was burned. 
And it's just not a real straightforward, easy thing to do. Now, once again, you know, most of the time we're going to be using moles somewhere, somehow, because that gets us from one place to the other. And so look at the example problem on page 238, 8.4. It says, a chemist burns 50 grams of an unknown substance containing only carbon and hydrogen. Well, that makes it easier than when it has other things in it. Uh, in a combustion analysis, she collects carbon dioxide and water vapor. What is the empirical formula of the substance? When he gives you one of these, I want you to notice that what you did was you took the mass of the product carbon dioxide and you took that to the moles of carbon dioxide, that is. And what he said there was that carbon had to come from the original thing you burned. And so because there's one carbon in CO2, it should be a one-for-one one relationship is how much carbon was in that original thing that you burned, which you're trying to figure out. So when you figure out the moles of the carbon dioxide, you are actually figuring out the moles of how much carbon was in the original product, uh, product reactant, the thing that you burned. Okay. Then you take the mass of the water that he gives you and you convert that into moles, but there's two hydrogens in every one mole of water. Therefore, you take whatever amount of moles of of water that you determine you have, and you multiply that by two, that tells you how much moles of hydrogen, how many, I can talk, how many moles of hydrogen were in the original reactant. So now you have the moles of carbon in the original reactant and the moles of hydrogen in the original reactant. Now you can divide them through by the least number of moles, and that will tell you the relationship between them so you can determine the empirical formula, correct? So let's try that one. Did we do uh, problem number eight together when we were together last? I don't think so either. So let's try that one. Let's just try that one. So on page 239, number eight, we have 100 grams of an unknown substance containing only carbon and hydrogen. Can you guys see better if I'm over here? Try that. Okay, only carbon and hydrogen were burned. If the complete combustion produced 313.7 uh, 313 grams of carbon dioxide and 128.8 grams of water, what is the empirical formula of the unknown substance? Okay, so we start by taking the amount, the mass of the carbon dioxide. If this would help any of you, I'm just gonna, I'm not trying to confuse you, I just wanna show you. What we're kind of doing is this. We have C, and we don't know how many there are. We have H, and we don't know how many there are, plus oxygen gas, and it produces carbon dioxide plus water vapor. Now, we don't know what the stoichiometric coefficients are in this at all, do we? But that's kind of what we're playing with, isn't it? Now, if that doesn't help you, just erase that from your mind, okay? But some of you, it might help you just to see it. And so what we do is it gives us the grams of this. So I'm going to, here, I'll write it here so you can see it. 318.7 grams of this and 128.4 grams of this. Okay, we're going to figure out how many moles each of those are because we know that However many moles of carbon are here, that's how many carbons have to be here because this is where it came from. However many moles of water there are, two times that is how many hydrogens there are in this. That's what he has us doing. Okay? So we take that and we go 318.7 grams. I'm sorry. Oh, you're right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany. Woo. Thank you. Uh, and that's CO2 times line. And so we know that there are 44.1 grams, only because we've done it so much, 44.01 grams of CO2 to every one mole of CO2. And so that's going to give us 7.127, 7.127 moles of CO2. Now, we have four significant figures, four significant figures, and we're multiplying or dividing, so we're gonna keep four significant figures. That's how many moles of CO2. So that also tells us over here, there's 7.127 moles of carbon. Okay. So far, so good. Now we're going to take the uh, water, 128.4, just make sure I got that right. Yep, okay. Grams of water, and uh, we're going to go times line, 18.02 grams, and this is one mole, and these are both water. 
and that's going to give us 7.125, 7.125 moles of water. Now we know that there's two hydrogens in every one mole of water. Therefore, to figure out how many hydrogens that had, I'm going to have to multiply that by two, aren't I? And so I multiply this by two, and that's going to give me 14.250 moles of hydrogen. And we have four significant figures. Here I have five, so I'm going to get rid of that. Four significant figures. There we go. Right? And so now I'm going to come back up here and I go 14.25 moles of hydrogen. Okay, so that's my moles of both of those, and that's why I did this. Now, once I have that, I wanted to find an empirical formula, and so I know that I divide both of those by the smaller number, and that's going to give me the empirical formula. And so 7.127 divided by 7.127 is going to be 1. So there's 1 carbon. And then 14.25 divided by 7.127 is going to give me something close to 2. So that's going to give me 2 hydrogens. So the empirical formula would be carbon and two hydrogens. I know it's a long way around to get there, but you can get there is the nice idea, right? That you can actually do it. Is everybody okay with that? No. Andrew? Yes? I have a question. So when you're doing this, you just round to whatever number would be closest to when you divide. Yes. You take, I'm going to just show you because I, I, I can hear what you're saying. So what we got... 1.27, I can write, 27 moles of carbon, and we have 14.25 moles of hydrogen. And so we take the smaller number and divide everybody through by it. And it's going to give you something close to two. Yes, sir, you are going to round at that point. Absolutely. Okay? Okay. Okay. So now, now that we thought that was hard, we're going to make it harder. Oh, boy. Okay, so the next one, it says more complicated combustion analysis. Uh, what we're going to do to this one is sometimes you don't have um, all the elements in the substance told to you. <laughs> oh, joy. And sometimes the ratios won't be whole numbers, which I already told you how to deal with that. But let's, let's see it. So on page 240, example 8.5, uh, it tells us a chemist burns 75 grams of an unknown substance. The complete combustion produces carbon, that much carbon dioxide, that much water. Nothing else is produced. OK, what is the empirical formula of the substance? Now, if only carbon dioxide and water are produced, that means only carbon, hydrogen, and possibly oxygen were in the original reactant because you don't have any other products. Remember, matter is neither created nor destroyed. It can only change form. So that means you had to start with just carbon, hydrogen, and possibly oxygen in the original thing. It couldn't have just shown up with something else. So that's a good thing. And so um, what you're going to do is you take the, just like in the last time, you take the carbon dioxide, you take it to the moles. That tells you how much carbon was in the original reactant. You take the water, you take uh, that mass of water, you take it to the moles, you multiply it by two. That tells you how much hydrogen moles-wise was in the original reactant. But you don't know how much oxygen was in the original reactant. So you see from there, you have to take the amount of carbon, the moles of carbon, take it back to mass. Then you're going to take the moles of hydrogen, take it back to mass, and you're going to add those masses up so that you can subtract that from the mass of the final product. That gives you the mass of how much oxygen there was. And then when you take that mass of oxygen and take it to moles, then you have the moles of each, and you can divide through by the lowest number, and you can figure out the mole ratios between them, correct? Let's try one. So let's try the one on page 241. On page 241, number 9, it says 100 grams of an unknown substance are burned. So now, once again, I'm not trying to confuse you. Did it confuse you when I showed it to you with the equation last time? Was that OK? OK. So this time, we have carbon, we have hydrogen, and we actually have oxygen, don't we? That's a Z, just in case it looks weird. OK. We are combusting it. And we are producing carbon dioxide and water vapor only. That tells us 
that there's probably oxygen in here. But we can know for sure by what we're doing here. It tells us that the carbon dioxide that was produced is 149.1 grams and that the water that's produced is 45.8 grams and that we started with 100 grams of the unknown solution. Okay, that's the information that's given to us, isn't it? So we're gonna find the moles of this. So we go 149.1 grams of CO2 times line. We have 44.01 grams of that to every one mole of that. I'm being bad, I should be writing CO2 here, both places. Okay, and that's going to give us 3.8 Eight, eight, four significant figures, moles of CO2. So that tells me, and I'm going to use this board over here, that tells me that in CXHYOZ, that tells me that I have 3.888 moles of carbon in this, don't I? Okay, have to. Now I figure out the water, so I'm going to go 45.8 grams of water, and I'm going to go times line, 18.02 grams to every one mole, okay, and that's water, water, and so that's going to give us 2.54 moles of water, okay, but there's two hydrogens in every one mole of water, therefore I have to multiply this by two, and so when I multiply that by two, I'm gonna get three significant figures. I'm gonna get 5.08 moles of hydrogen in this original thing, right? That's what I've got, so far so good. We're just doing the same thing we've been doing before. But now we know there's somebody else involved, and we can make sure of that by, by figuring this out. If we take 3.888 moles of carbon, and we want to know how many grams that is. Uh, one mole is 12.01, yep, 12.01 grams. And so in that many moles of carbon, we actually have 40.69 grams of carbon. Now, if we take the hydrogen and 1.01, yep, grams, whoops, <laughs> you know what I just saw here, I got moles here, I gotta have moles on the bottom, don't I? So one mole to 1.01 grams, these are both water, that's gonna end up giving me 5.13. 5.13 grams of water. I'm, gonna, I'm running out of space here. If I add these two up, and that's what I have to do, that tells me how much carbon and hydrogen I started with over here, doesn't it? So if I add these two up, I'm gonna pull these numbers out so you can see them. 0 0.69 grams of carbon plus five, line it up, Katie, 5.13 grams of, that shouldn't be H2O, I'm so sorry, that's just hydrogen. You guys are being so quiet, you're being so good. But you can tell me when I mess up, I appreciate it. Um, anyway, and so this ends up giving us 45.82, 45.82 grams of carbon and hydrogen in this original thing. But look what I started with. I started with 100 grams. That tells me how much oxygen was in the original sample, doesn't it? And so I, I'm going to go ahead and over here, I'm going to say 100 grams minus the carbon and the hydrogen, and that's why I had to go through all that to find out how much mass of oxygen there was to f figure out how many moles. Then that's going to give me 54.18 grams, and that would have to be oxygen, wouldn't it? That's going to have to be oxygen. I'm going to move this. Okay. All right, so now I can take that and I can go to the moles of oxygen. There is 16.0, oh, I don't like this marker, excuse me.
Okay, grams of oxygen to every one mole of oxygen. And that's going to end up giving us 3.386. 3.386 moles of oxygen. Now I have all three. Here I go. This is what we were trying to find, wasn't it? And now I have the number of moles of each of these. What am I going to divide them all through by? Andrew, look up here, sweetie. What am I going to divide all these through by? Uh, 3.386. Very good, very good. So I'm going to divide each of these numbers through by 3.386. Uh, what ends up happening when I do that, let's see, what do we end up getting? The first one, we get a 1. The second one, we get a 1.5. So the first one, we'd end up with a 1. I'm going to divide each of these by this number. The second one, we get a 1.5. And the third one, we get a 1. Now, that means I would have to put a 1, a 1.5, and a 1. And I can't do that, right? So when you have that situation, like we said before, you just multiply by 2. So I'm going to come up here. And I'm going to go 2, 3, 2, because I'm, I'm just multiplying each of these by 2. And there's my empirical formula. Now, that is a huge amount of work. A lot of places that you could mess up. The only reason I say this is because you saw me do it. So what I want you to do is make sure that you bring all your work to class for your test so that if you're just going along and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you just mess up a little bit, I can see it and I can give you most of the credit. That's what I'm saying, okay? And if you really are having trouble with it, you could always study it and take it again. But if you just made a little mistake because you were busy and your little brother came in or the dog came in and took your shoe or whatever, you know what I'm saying, then my dogs do stuff like that. It's terrible. Um, so, you know, then you can show me your work and I can give you most of the credit. <laughs> I love having two boards. This is great. Okay. Anyway, any questions on that? We okay? We have questions? Guys, we okay, Jay? Okay. Did I do something wrong? No, I was like, I had that conversation with my mother because I'm sitting there doing the study guide. She was like, why is it taking you so long? And I'm like, look at the questions. Oh, yeah. And I'll show you my work. And like, literally, I have like half the page of calculations. Right. And solving out the thing. I'm like, this is like an eight step problem. Oh, absolutely. And actually, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it takes you a page per problem. And, and this is why it is so absolutely imperative that you show all your work because you could be doing everything just right and just have a hiccup and it changes your answer, doesn't it? Okay. And let's be honest, in chemistry exams, you frequently don't have time to go back and redo everything to double check everything because they're three hour exams and your brain kind of turns to mush by the time you're done anyway. And I'm sorry. <laughs> So, at least they were when I was in school. I don't know if they've changed that, that, but they probably still are three-hour exams. Yeah, what they do is they schedule it on, like, Saturday morning, and you come in and you take your exam. Um, totally separate time than the rest of your classes. You know who that used to be really hard for was the Jewish students. Observant Jews, they would always have to do a, a makeup exam, which were always harder than the uh, regular exams. And I always felt sorry for those students because they should have just known. They weren't cheating. If it was an observant Jew, they couldn't come take the exam Saturday morning. You know, they should have given it to them on Sunday morning or something, you know. So, but I always felt badly for them because I knew a few people in school that that was the situation. Um, okay, then we get to determining empirical formulas for percentage composition. And Turn the page. On page 242, it shows us that if we're told that a substance has 40% calcium, 12% carbon, and 48% oxygen, what is the empirical formula? And this is pretty straightforward. You just figure, okay, these are percentages, which means they're parts of 100 pieces. So if we figure we started with 100 
grams, then we can just say, okay, the calcium is 40 grams of it. The, wow, my fingers are so black. Uh, <laughs> the carbon, don't touch myself. The carbon is 12 grams of it and the oxygen is 48 grams of it. And then you just take it to moles, divide everybody through by whoever is the lowest number. It tells you their ratios to one another and you just apply that to find your empirical formula. That's pretty straightforward. On the next page, on page 243, um, where it tells you the percent, comp you're determining the percentage composition for each of them, that's pretty simple too. You just add up the molecular mass for the whole molecule, then you take the sodium and add up how much of the grams of sodium are in that, divide it by the total, and times 100, that's going to give you the percentage right? Because it's giving you the piece of the pie that it makes that up. So let's try both of those um, on page 243. Let's see, this is the one I like, right? And this is the one I don't. <laughs> okay, number 10. What is the percent composition for each element in the compound? All right, so we have H... 3PO4. So first thing we have to do is add it up. So we have 3 times 1.01, .01, right? You guys know how to do this part. Plus, phosphorus is 30.97 grams. Plus, oxygen is 4 times 16.00 grams. So you get for the total of this 98.00 grams. And that's how much that weighs. Now you take it and you go, okay, well the oxygen, which is 3.03 .03 grams, divided by 98.00 grams times 100, gives us a percentage of 3.09%. Then the phosphorus, which was 30.97 grams, divided by the total times 100, gives you the percentage of phosphorus, which is 31.60%. And then four times 16 is, I think it's 40, no, 64, thank you. I didn't write it down, I don't know why. 64 grams divided by 98 grams times 100, God bless you, that gives us 65.31%. Okay, so that's oxygen, that's phosphorus, that's hydrogen. Okay? That's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, the one below it, the unknown substance is 62.2% iron, that much oxygen, that much hydrogen. What's the empirical formula? Well, in this case, you're just going to moles again. So you just take it and you go 62.2. Um, we're going to make that grams of iron times line. And so you look up iron and it's 55.85 grams to every one mole. And so that's going to give you 1.11 moles of iron. And then, let's see, the next one it gives you is oxygen, 35.6 grams of oxygen times line. There's 16.00 grams of oxygen to every one mole of oxygen. So that's going to end up giving us 35. There it is. 2.23 moles of oxygen. And the last one is 2.2 grams of hydrogen times line, 1.01 gram of hydrogen to every one mole of hydrogen. And so that's going to end up giving you 2.2, two significant figures, hmm, 2.2 moles of hydrogen. All right, now we have the moles. What are we going to do next? This is easy. What are we going to do next? Get the smallest one divided yeah. by both. Thank you. We divide everybody through by the smallest number there. And the smallest number there is 2.2. So we know, oh, excuse me. The smallest number there is 1.11. I can do this, really. OK. Uh, and so if we divide it all through by this, we're going to have one iron. We're going to have two oxygens, and we're going to have two hydrogens. And you can write it like that. That's fine. But in this chapter, you learned that there is a polyatomic ion, hydroxide. And so really, this is this, isn't it? That's what it actually is, just so you know. But you, you'll get full credit doing it this way. It's fine. Okay? 
Okay. Um, they're bored. Can you try to get out? Can you just write what it is like that? This way? Yeah. Yeah, you can write it this way. Yeah. That's actually the correct way to write it, but that would be right, but that's the correct way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, I personally like polytonic ions because when you're balancing an equation and it's got polyatomic ions in it, if the polyatomic ion stays the same from one side to the other, you don't count them individually. You count the ion. So you just take the sulfate or the phosphate and you see how many are here and how many are here and put the numbers where you need them out front. Don't break them up. Don't multiply them through unless you have to. Only if they're broken up from one side to the other do you have to actually count them. Does that make sense? But if they stay and you see it, it went from that ion on this side to that ion on that side, just count the ions. Don't break it apart. Make it easy. Yes. So I like them. I like them in that way. Okay. Polyatomic ions, we're told, is an ion composed of two or more atoms that are covalently bonded together to one another. Turn the page on page 244. And this is the trick. Polyatomic ions actually have covalent bonds, but they overall have a charge. And because they have a charge, they're an ion. So they're involved in ionic compounds. They, they make ionic compounds, but they are covalently bound together. So they have both things going on, don't they? They really do. And it shows us here how when the hydrogen gets together with the oxygen, that the hydrogen's happy because it has two electrons, but that the oxygen is still lacking one of the eight that it wants. And therefore, if it can get together with a metal that wants to give away an electron, now both the hydrogen and the oxygen will have full outer shells, and therefore they'll both be happy, but they end up getting a one, negative one charge because they have one extra electron compared to the numbers of protons they have, but that's very attractive to the hydroxide ion, and it's also very attractive to the group one metal that wants to give away one electron like sodium, and therefore we have things like salt um, formed and stuff like that. Well, actually, sodium hydroxide is a base, and it's a hardcore base. So um, anyway, so let's see. You already memorized some of these, the uh, bolded ones. Somebody was kind enough to point that out, that you only had to memorize the bolded ones. I'm so glad. You are getting away with murder compared to all the other classes. I just want you to know that, <laughs> okay, as far as having to uh, memorize these things. So you only have to know ammonium, hydronium, carbonate, hydroxide, nitrate, sulfate, and phosphate. And when I say only, I seriously mean only. Oh, that's not bad. And so you need to know their name, you need to know the formula, you need to know the charge. Okay, so at the bottom of the page, example 8.8, it says sodium carbonate is used in the manufacture of most kinds of glass. What is its chemical formula? Well, sodium is Na and carbonate is, <laughs> Just going to be doing so many of these. Sodium is Na, and you look on the chart, and it's a group one metal, so it's plus one. Carbonate is CO3 minus two. I know I do mine flip flopped, is how I did it in college, so just please forgive me. He does it backwards compared to me. We flip flop these numbers just like we learned before, don't we? So we just flip flop this. We give this one the two, this one gets the one, so that's sodium carbonate. You're done but you have to know the charges to be able to do it. The next one is magnesium nitrate. So we have magnesium and we look and magnesium is a group two metal so it's gonna be plus two and nitrate is C, uh, NO3 minus one, okay? And so these are gonna flip flop. Now this one gets the one but this one gets the two. So we're gonna put parentheses around it and put the two because that tells me that I have one magnesium attached to two nitrates. That's what that says, isn't it? Okay? All right. So, turn the page, please. Uh, he tells us here that the important difference between, let's see. There's no physical bonds between ions, but there are physical bonds within the polyatomic ions because they're actually covalently bonded together. Bonded together. Um, ionic compounds are usually formed from metals with a nonmetal, but this is the exception, isn't it? The exception is when you have two polyatomic ions attached to one another because like ammonia, 
ammonium, which is a polyatomic ion, NH4 plus one. If that is together with a um, negative polyatomic ion, that's still an ionic compound, and there's no metal in there, is there? So that's our exception to the rule on figuring out if something is an ionic compound, is if it's made up of ions, it's an ionic compound. And if they're polyatomic ions, they don't have to be a metal. That's the point that he's making, and it's a very good one. Okay, so um, on page 247, number 12, it says, what is the name of K2SO4? What's the name of that? What's K? Potassium. Okay, and what's SO4? Sulfate. So it's potassium sulfate. You're done. Remember ionic compounds, you just name the, the first ion, which is the cation, and then you name the second ion, which is the anion. Remember cation's positive, anion's negative. Okay, you name the first, name the second, you're done, because you figure out the, the subscripts by their charges, don't you? Okay, um, so the next one, it says, what's the chemical formula? We have aluminum. What's the charge going to be on aluminum? Look at your chart. What's the charge going to be on aluminum? Plus three. Plus three. Okay, and then carbonate. CO3, what's that charge? Two. Minus two. You're going to flip-flop your charges. So the two is going to come down here, and the three is going to come over here, and that's aluminum carbonate. It's the same thing we did before, isn't it? Um, it says how many oxygen atoms are in that empirical formula. Okay, well that is the empirical formula because you can't divide through by two and three, right? Um, so how many oxygens are in there? Nine. Nine. Three times three, correct? How are we doing? Can everybody see that though? So this is basically, I'm, I'm not telling you it's really like this because these are, these are ionic bonds, but this is basically where you have this attached somehow, right? They're not real bonds, though. There's attractions there. But that's what's actually going on in here. Just like the last one I showed you, I was just showing you basically how many were there. But it, it's not structurally correct, because when I put lines there, it actually should represent shared pairs of electrons. And ionic compounds, there are no shared pairs of electrons. OK. They designate when they write down or set up those. They don't. Um, it, it, they don't. They, they just don't. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, number 14, uh, what is the name of, and then it's FEPO4. So what's FE? Iron. And what's PO4? Phosphate. phosphate. So what's the name of that? Iron phosphate. iron phosphate. Now, very good. Somebody pointed out, it says, please note that iron can have different charges if we include the Roman numeral in the name. Um, so you need to include the Roman numeral in the name. And the way we know how to do that is iron phosphate. Here we go. What's the charge on phosphate? Negative three, so that means this had to be a positive three, didn't it? So that told us to name it iron, Roman numeral three, phosphate. That's how we knew that. Okay? All right. Um, so let's go to the test preparation.